All right, let's continue with lessons for week three. Remember that you do have quizzes due this week. Make sure you complete them on time. And remember that there is a test coming up. Check your course outline for the date and time of that test. And remember also that you can pause this video at any time, rewind to listen again. So this week we want to continue by talking about polynomial functions. We're going to represent, at least for now, a polynomial function as the p of x. And a p, we're looking at polynomials with one variable, so generally that variable is going to be x. We could call it the f of r, if r was the variable being used, the g of m, if m is being the variable that is used. Most of the time we're going to be talking about polynomials with a variable x. And you can see that this very long and confusing looking example is a polynomial function. So we say that a sub n, a sub n minus 1, all of those parts These are the coefficients of our polynomial. They are the numbers that are multiplying our powers of x. That sub n, sub n minus 1, that's just counting the number of coefficients. And n has to be an integer. That means n is not a fraction, n is not a decimal, and n has to be greater than or equal to zero. So notice that in our last coefficient there, a sub zero, we could say that that's multiplying x to the power of 0. Because if you look at the powers on x, x to the power of 1, then we would have x to the power of 2, x to the power of 3, until we get to n. This is going to give us the highest power on x. Now x is the variable here, our unknown. But because we're saying that we have x to the power of n, x to the power of n minus 1, and we see we're going smaller and smaller all the way down to x to the power of 0, this tells us that the powers on x are always integers. That means the powers on x are not fractions. Not decimals. And of course, if it looks like we have just a to the power of, or sorry, just a, some number at the end, we are multiplying by x to the power of zero. So it is possible to have a zero exponent on x. We're going to talk about the degree of polynomials as we go ahead and look at the properties of polynomials. So you're going to need to identify that the degree of the polynomial is always n, the highest power. If we go back and look at that example that we had written at the top of the page, we can see here a sub n times x to the power of n. In this case, it's at the front of our polynomial. It also gives us the highest power on x. Every other power, n minus 1, n minus 2, n minus 3, all the way down to 1 and 0, all of the other powers on x are less than n. We are also going to talk about the leading coefficient. 
the leading coefficient multiplies the highest power of x. So let's look at this. The leading coefficient, then in my example here, this is my leading coefficient. The number that multiplies the highest power of x. Let's look at this example of a polynomial function. We can see the coefficients, the numbers that are multiplying the powers of x. Notice that we're not writing down the numbers, the zeros that are multiplying the powers of x that are not given. Usually, unless we're talking about division, synthetic division and long division, we don't worry about those zero coefficients. Our leading coefficient, that's the number multiplying the highest power of x. Here's our term with the highest power of x. So the leading coefficient is negative three. The degree is the highest power on x. We see that that's a five here. Make sure that you can identify the degree of a polynomial and the leading coefficient. This is going to be very important as we talk about the properties of polynomial functions. Now, when we look at this polynomial function here, we say that it is written in descending powers of x. Oops, I wanted to put that down here. Sorry, let me see if I can erase that. I don't know why I can't. It is written in standard form. And standard form means that it is written in descending powers of x. We start with the highest degree the highest power on x, and then we go down from there. Notice also that in standard form, we have no multiplication, no division. This is the addition and subtraction of terms. In fact, those of you who are in Math 99 will recognize that this polynomial has four terms, four parts that are being added or subtracted. This polynomial is not written in standard form. So let's start with that. Let's write this polynomial in standard form. That means we're going to need to open the brackets. I would do this part first. Remember, 2 minus x all squared means 2 minus x times 2 minus x. That means two times the second bracket minus x times the second bracket. So now we have negative two times x squared minus four x plus four times x plus one. We need to keep multiplying. I would multiply these next. Pause the video, see if you can finish multiplying 
and opening the brackets for this polynomial function. Okay, so you can see here that I've continued multiplying. First, I opened the trinomial times the binomial. We ended up with x cubed minus 3x squared plus 4. And then I multiplied everything by 2. So here's our g of x in standard form. Our coefficients, now we can see the coefficients, are negative 2, 6, and negative 8. Notice that we don't see those coefficients when we look at the polynomial here. The polynomial I gave you was not in standard form. Now I can also see the lead coefficient. The leading coefficient is negative 2. And the degree is 3. Now some of you may have seen the degree of the polynomial before you even open the brackets. If you look back here, you can see that here we have an exponent of 2 that will go on x. So that opening that bracket will give us an x squared. And here, even though no number is written, we have a degree of 1. That 2 plus 1 is going to give us the degree of the polynomial. You're going to want to have some practice finding the leading coefficient and finding the degree of the polynomial. So let's look at the polynomials that I've got given below here. Well, they're not all polynomials. I want you to determine whether or not the given function is a polynomial. And if it is, write down the degree and write down the leading coefficient. So pause your video. When we look at the f of x, we see that yes, it is a polynomial. All of the exponents on x are integers. It has a highest exponent on x of 3. And that means that 7, multiplying the highest power of x, is our leading coefficient. The m of x is also a polynomial function. The highest power on x is 2, so it has a degree of 2. And negative 6 is the number, the coefficient, multiplying the highest power of x. Now I hope you know that the square root of x can also be written as x to the power of 1 half. We said that polynomials have integer exponents on x. This is not a polynomial function. If we look at this one, I hope you recognize that this could be written as x squared plus 8 times x cubed plus 1 to the power of negative 1. We said that the powers on x had to be greater than or equal to 0. This is not a polynomial function. In fact, this is a rational function. We'll be talking a little bit about those next class next week's class, I should say. Now, when we look at the f of x here, maybe you can see that the degree is 5. I hope you can see that. When I open these brackets, I would have x squared minus 2x plus 1. And when I multiply x cubed by x squared, that would give me the highest degree of 5. In fact, when I open these brackets, I get 2x to the power of 5 minus 4x to the power of 4 plus 2x cubed. I can see that my leading coefficient, the number multiplying the highest power of x, is 2. If you need to pause the video and try the last one, then do so.
I see. Oh, what's happening here? That's not what I wanted to do. I can see that the degree is going to be five. Can you see that? If I opened up this bracket and multiplied two minus X times two minus X, the highest power of X would be X squared. If I opened these brackets, four minus X cubed, negative X times negative X times negative X would give me a highest power of X, negative X cubed. And then when I multiply X cubed times X squared, I see that the degree would be five. The number multiplying the highest power of X, well, I have one X squared here and negative one X cubed all multiplied by three. The leading coefficient here would be negative three. Make sure you take some time, use the questions in your e-text to find those degrees and the leading coefficients. This is going to be important as we continue talking about polynomial functions. We've been graphing different uh, function graphs. We also looked at piecewise defined functions. And in fact, this graph in front of us in purple here looks like a piecewise defined function. Now here's the thing about the graph of a polynomial function. It is always going to be smooth and continuous. Smooth means there are no sharp corners, no Vs. Continuous means there are no jumps. So let's look at these examples of graphs and decide whether or not they are polynomial functions. The first one is, it is smooth. There are no sharp points and there are no jumps. What about the second one? It is not. There is a jump right here. You would have to pick up your pencil and go to the next part of the graph. It is not a polynomial function graph. What about the third one? No, it's not. This is a sharp point. We don't want anything sharp in a polynomial function graph. And this one, well, it just goes off the paper. Yes, it is. It is the graph of a polynomial function. It is smooth and continuous. It was just too big to fit on my piece of paper. So we're gonna be working towards graphing these polynomial functions in this lecture and the next one. So to start, we want to talk about the end behaviors. And it's all of the different properties of a polynomial function that are going to help you graph these functions. Let's start talking about functions of even degree. Now you already know a function of even degree. You know the graph of f of x equals x squared. We're also going to look at the f of x equals negative. That's not a very good negative sign. And I can't erase it again, why not? There we go. Can you quickly sketch in those two graphs?
Now, what do we notice about these graphs? Well, we notice that both of them have an even degree. In the first one, we notice that the leading coefficient is positive. And in the second, we notice that the leading coefficient is negative. What's the difference between these graphs? Well, remember, we're looking at their end behavior. What are the graphs doing at the ends? When we have an even degree, and the leading coefficient is positive, we notice that both ends are pointing up. We say that both ends are rising. When we have an even degree, but a negative leading coefficient, we notice that both ends are pointing down. Both ends are falling. Whenever we have a function of even degree, and a positive leading coefficient. We say that the ends will rise on the left and rise on the right. So that means the left end of the graph will rise, the right end of the graph will rise. Now we are talking about polynomial function graphs, so they're going to be smooth and continuous. It doesn't matter what it looks like between the ends right now. All we're talking about is the end behavior. Maybe it's just doing this. Maybe it's doing this. But all we're looking at right now, when we have an even degree and a positive leading coefficient, is the ends. The ends will both rise. Now, if we have a function of even degree, and a negative leading coefficient. Then the ends will fall on the left and fall on the right. For every polynomial function with an even degree and a negative leading coefficient, the ends will both fall. And then perhaps it looks like this in between. Oops, what happened to my graph? Perhaps it will look like this, as long as it's smooth and continuous. If we have a negative leading coefficient and an even degree, the ends will both fall. Oop, this is a mistake here. This is supposed to say odd. What if we're looking at functions of odd degree? Well, we know a function of odd degree. 
we know what the f of x equals x cubed looks like. So let's look at f of x equals x cubed and negative x cubed. Can you quickly sketch those graphs here and pay attention to their end behaviors? On the left, the degree is odd and the leading coefficient is positive. What are the ends doing? How are those ends different from this graph? On the right, the degree is still odd, but this time my leading coefficient is negative one. So notice when we have an odd degree and a positive leading coefficient, on the left, the end is falling. On the right, the end is rising. The opposite is true here. When the leading coefficient is negative, on the left, the graph is rising, and on the right, the end is falling. This is going to be true for every function of odd degree. If we have a function of odd degree, with a positive leading coefficient, The graph is going to fall on the left and rise on the right. And in between the ends, we're just going to have some polynomial function graph. Doesn't really matter what it looks like at this point. We haven't talked about that yet. If we have a function of odd degree and a negative leading coefficient, the graph is going to rise on the left and fall on the right. And in between, some kind of polynomial function graph that is smooth and continuous. So you're going to need to memorize these end behaviors. Maybe you're going to make yourself a little table. You can write even positive, both ends up, negative, both ends down. An odd degree. If a positive leading coefficient, a negative leading coefficient. Somehow you're just going to need to remember them. Of course, we know these graphs. We know what x squared looks like. We know what negative x squared looks like. We know what x cubed looks like. We know what negative x cubed looks like. If you've memorized those basic function graphs, you already know what the end behaviors are going to do. Make sure you review those basic function graphs. So, 
let's try to figure out what the ends of these graphs are going to be doing. In question one, we have a degree of two. It is even. We have a leading coefficient that is negative. That means I'm thinking about the graph of negative x squared. I know that these ends will fall on the left and fall on the right. Pause this video and see if you can find the end behaviors for the remaining questions here. In question two, we have a degree of five. We have a leading coefficient of positive eight. That means I'm thinking about the graph of positive x cubed. This is an odd degree. The end behaviors, well, this graph is going to fall on the left and rise on the right. Just like that graph of x cubed. In question three, we see we have a degree of eight. It is even. It has a leading coefficient of seven. That is positive. That means the end behaviors are going to be the same as that graph of x squared. They are going to rise on the left and rise on the right. In question four, the degree, well, I'm looking at five plus three plus one. This has a degree of eight. I'm going to have negative two times x cubed times x to the five. That gives me a leading coefficient of negative two. It's negative. I'm thinking here, because this is even, about the graph of negative x squared, where both ends fall. And you need to tell me that the graph is falling on the left and falling on the right. If you just write fall, I don't know what you mean. You need to be clear that both ends are falling. In question five, we have x to the power of four times x squared times x to the power of one. This has a degree of seven. Our leading coefficient is multiplying negative seven times one x squared times 1x, our leading coefficient is negative. So we have a function of odd degree with a negative leading coefficient. So we're thinking about the graph of negative x cubed. It is going to rise on the left and fall on the right. In question six, I have x squared times x to the power of one. This has a degree of three, an odd degree. We have a negative one out in front, multiplying 
Well, negative x times negative x is going to give me a positive x squared times x, 1x. My leading coefficient is negative. So again, I'm thinking about negative x cubed. My ends will rise on the right and fall on the left. So now if you were asked to graph any of these polynomial functions, at the very least, you would know what the ends of the graph will be doing. But we need to know what's happening in the middle. The x-intercepts are going to help us determine what goes on in between the ends. You've already been finding x-intercepts whenever you solve a polynomial equation. The first thing we usually want to do is factor. And then we solve for the polynomial function equals zero. Because remember, x-intercepts are found when y equals zero. And remember that p of x represents y. Oof, that was weird. Let me get rid of that. So for this example, we want to find the x-intercepts of this function. It is already factored for you. So we know that we want to let the function or the p of x equal zero. And we know how to solve this. We let each factor equal zero. I didn't need those brackets there. We see that x could equal zero or one or negative three. These are the x-intercepts of our graph. Now think about what those x-intercepts are saying. When x equals zero, that tells me that the p of zero equals zero. Remember, we're just substituting, changing x. The p of one also equals zero. And the p of negative three equals zero. So we want to start thinking about what these notations mean and how we use them when we're talking about polynomial functions. We're going to talk about them as the real zeros of a polynomial function. So, if f is a function and r is a real number for which the f of r equals zero, think about that. We just wrote that over here on the last page. The p of r equals zero, the p of r equals zero, the p of r equals zero. What was this zero? this one, 
and this negative three. They were our x-intercepts. They were our solutions to this equation. So if f is a function and r is a real number for which the f of r equals zero, then we say that r is called a real zero of the function. We know that x equals r is an x-intercept. We know that x minus r is a factor of the function. And we know that r is a solution to the equation f of x equals zero. There are four different ways that we can talk about this value r. So make sure you read that over and look at the example before this and see how these statements apply to each other. Here's a question we might ask you. Find a polynomial f of degree three, whose zeros are negative three, two, and five. Why is it doing this every time? All right, that's what I wanted. So we want to find a polynomial of degree three with these zeros. Well, remember that R is a zero. And if R is a zero, then we just highlighted here that X minus R is a factor. So we want a polynomial f, so there's my polynomial notation, f of x equals x minus r, x minus negative three gives me x plus three, x minus r, x minus r. Does this have a degree of three? Absolutely. If we open these brackets, we have x times x times x, or x to the power of three. That means we know the x-intercepts. There's an x-intercept at negative three, at two, and at five. We can also find the end behaviors. What if we are multiplying by positive one? Well, then we have an odd degree and a positive leading coefficient. We're going to think about the graph positive x cubed, where the ends are falling on the left and rising on the right. The ends always come out of the intercepts on the outside, falling on the left, rising on the right, if A equals one. But what happens if A equals negative one?
Well, we still have an odd degree. But now we have a negative leading coefficient. So we need to think about the graph of negative x cubed, where the n's rise on the right and fall on the left. In this case, rising on the right, falling on the left, if a equals negative 1. We're getting closer to being able to see what this graph might look like. Look at question two. Can you find two polynomials, f and g, of degree four, whose zeros are negative two, negative one, and three? Pause the video, give it a try. So we want polynomial f, so f of x, x minus r, x minus r, x minus r. Does this have a degree of four? No, it has a degree of three. You want to put an x here? No, 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 you can't do that. Because this is going to give me a real zero of zero. I don't have zero listed here. I can't add in another real zero. The only zeros are negative two, negative one, and three. So what are we going to do instead? Well, I hope you realized you can just change the power on one of these. Now I have a degree of four. So g of x, same real zeros, but maybe we squared this one. This one also has a degree of 4. There was actually a third possibility. I only asked for two of them. Each of these has the real zeros negative 2, negative 1, and 3. Each of these also has a degree of 4. Now we're going to have to omit question 3 because we haven't talked about multiplicities yet. I'm going to pause this lecture for now, give you some time to listen to it again or work on some of your e-text questions, and we will finish up week three lecture in the next section.